Good morning, church family. I want to welcome you all for being here today. Um, I talked with Brother Mackey uh, yesterday, and he said, Brother Brian, he said, uh, would you be willing to step up for me today? And I said, I think we can probably make that happen. So I'm here today and want to present with you kind of what the Lord's laid on our heart a little bit today. Uh, but before we get started, I, I just want to let you know God is good. Amen? I, I want you to tell your neighbor sitting next to you that God is good. Now, Kat, I don't know who you can tell. No one's sitting by you, but um, I just want us to be reminded of how good God is, correct? Uh, several years ago, uh, I added a word to my vocabulary, and a lot of times Barry Countyans, uh, like myself, will come up with words. Now, it's not get or done. Uh, that's, I don't know where that word came up with or come from, but uh, I've got another wor word, and it's called gooder. And uh, I know God is good, but God keeps getting gooder. Amen? Now tell your neighbor, God keeps getting gooder. Okay, all right. Now, I'm not the only one that talks that way, okay? I just taught you all something. Uh, but it is. It seems like the more that we serve the Lord, the longer that we are Christians, uh, the better God keeps getting, right? And so I've added that word in my vocabulary several years ago, and I kind of play around with it a little bit. And I'm sure I get a lot of um, uh, folks who probably think, man, that guy's kind of strange. Why would he talk like that? And, and if you are a teacher and, and you uh, certainly teach language arts or English, and uh, your student or you hear me use that word, you're probably thinking, man, that guy is a hillbilly. But anyway, it's, it's always good to think about how good God is, okay? So uh, before we really get into the message today, I want to talk with you about restoration. Now some of you in here today probably like restoring things, whether it be old automobiles, whether it be housing houses, uh, uh, maybe you like restoring furniture, and if I would ask for a raise of hands, probably several of you would raise your hands and say, yes, Brian, I, I love restoring antique furniture, or I like taking an older automobile and, and making it look new. And there might be even some of you in here today that like doing that process with, with a house. Maybe you've bought an older house and uh, you want to kind of fix it up. You want to get rid of that pink and purple carpet and those uh, yellow countertops and, and those bluish green looking toilets that were very popular back in the 70s and 80s. You all know what I'm talking about. Candace and I, actually, when we got married uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, we just celebrated our 20-year anniversary here just recently, our first house was one of those houses that we bought in Monette that needed a lot of fixing up. And our entrepreneur mindset was, how about we go in and start fixing this thing up and do a live-in flip? This was long before Chip and Joanna was popular, right? So uh, we bought this house and, and we took our own money. Candace had a pot of money that she saved up and I had some money that I saved up. We bought this house for like 50, I don't know, 52,000. It really wasn't much. It was like 1,100 square feet, but it was just perfect for us. Three bedroom, two bath. We went in, we stripped all the carpet out. We put new carpet, we painted the walls. We put new countertops in, new toilets because the toilets were that wrong color. And so we did all of those things. We fixed up the yard, built a fence, and we flipped that thing in two years and made $30,000 off of that. And our mind was like, if we can just do this five or six times, we will have no mortgage. And that was our mindset. And so we sold that place. We took the gains from that and put into the next house that we began to fix up. And 2008 came. And guess what? We didn't make any profit off that deal. And so we were like, maybe we're just not cut out for this. I mean, we were starting to have babies at that time, and, and it was hard living in a place that you were trying to fix up. But we enjoyed that restoration process. I kind of do a little bit of that now with our lawn care company. I, I don't have nothing really big, but we do like going into properties and mowing the grass and making the place look nice and 
with mowing that's really slowed down, I've, I've talked to a lot of my customers and they're wanting me to go in and trim hedges and trim the lower canopies of the trees and make their place beautiful. And we're able to do that to keep food on the table. And, and I enjoy that process of taking something that needs a little bit of an uplift and making it look beautiful again. I like taking those pictures of before and after and posting them on our uh, Facebook page. It's kind of fun. I, I enjoy that process. And you're saying, okay, Brother Brian, what, well, we're here to talk about the Lord. Yes. I just want to let you know that God likes the restoration process in our own lives. Did you know that? He likes to take something that needs quite a bit of work. And if we are able to get in and get dirty and, and let the Lord work on our lives, a beautiful thing can take place. In fact, the Scripture talks about a restoration process, and that's where we want to take you in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. If you have your Bible, turn there with, you, with me. I, I don't have no notes or anything on the screen, but I'm, I'm pretty simple, and so I think you'll be able to follow along with me just fine. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 is a wonderful passage of Scripture, verse 14, and I, I want to read it, and then we want to talk a little bit about it. But there is a four-step process for spiritual restoration. Four steps. Just like there's steps to home remodeling, there's steps to uh, refurnishing furniture, there's steps to refurnishing an old automobile or a tractor or something. Uh, there's processes that you do. The Bible gives us processes of restoration. If we want to be restored... Uh, because believe me, folks, there's times in our lives that we get a little hard-headed and get stuck in our own ways. And we might be Christians, but God, it seems like He can't do much with us because we've kind of maybe laid down a little bit and we've got a little rusty. And the Lord's saying, hey, how about this area of your life you try to get it fixed? And so He gives us this restoration process. Verse 14 says, If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You see, during the dedication here of this newly constructed temple, Solomon prayed to God in Second Chronicles chapter 6 and he asked him to forgive and restore the people of Israel because they've sinned. And then we get into chapter 14 and we read the Scripture just like what we've read. Israelite, they, they've sinned. But they could be restored if they go through this four-step process. You see, God's Word is eternal. And just as this process was important for them in this time frame, we can use this same application for me and you today. If we go through this four-step process, we can be restored as well. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, Brother Brian, I was saved at a young age. I'm a Christian. I know where I'm going. That's fine. But folks, I know just like an old house, that carpet kind of wears out. The paint needs freshened up. Uh, the countertops might need change. There's always a little bit of work. There's things that uh, go faulty. And just in our own life, it's the same way. Sometimes we get set in our head of one thing, and then before you know it, we find ourselves missing church. And before you know it, we're not in the Word reading like what we should. And we get a little rusty. and We have some creaks, uh, cracks uh, in our lives, and it seems like there's things that are not going like they should, and it's almost like God's trying to get our attention and say, hey, Brian, you need to realize you're not the person you used to be. You used to love going to church. You used to love reading the Word. You used to love serving other people. And you used to love being uh, 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 personable with people and, and putting forth great impressions. But now it's like you're mad at the world and mad at everything else and God can't work with a vessel like that. He can only work with willing vessels. And God wants to restore a vessel. So the first step in this spiritual restoration, and that's what I see here in the Scripture when we look at verse 14, He says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble 
themselves. So I underline the word humble here being the first step to the process. It's humility. It starts with first recognizing of our nothingness before an Almighty God. We, re we realize that we have no rights nor commendations before the Lord. On my own, I'm both guilty and I'm unworthy to be in His holy presence. God is everything and I am nothing. We have to humble ourselves. We've got to recognize our failures. We've got to manifest our sorrows. And we've got to have that renewed commitment to the Lord. Humbling ourselves before God and His Word means that we recognize our own spiritual poverty. You ever get to that point where you get into God's Word and you read it? and You may have read this Scripture in the years past and it really didn't do a whole lot, but you read it now and it's almost like, Wow, Lord, I'm, I'm not where I need to be. I'm not where I used to be. We've got to humble ourselves. The second step here in what I read in verse 14 is not only humble, but it says to pray. This same process that was given to the Israelites is the same process that God wants us to see. This is that second step to spiritual restoration is prayer. Prayer is an act of humility. And prayer is not presenting God a list of our desires, which many of us probably do at times. But prayer is what God cares about. He doesn't care about uh, what we want or our desires, but He cares about our needs. And He instructs us to cast all our care upon Him. That prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth that is it in heaven. He tells us here that we need to be humbling ourselves before God and pray. God's people must cry out before Him. There needs to be that open line of, of communication where we cry out to the Lord in desperation for that mercy. Where we've got to completely depend upon Him and trust in Him for His intervention in our lives. We've got to humble ourselves. We've got to pray. There has to be that prayer in our lives. And then this third step here in the process to spiritual restoration is communion or fellowship. And that's what he tells us here in verse 14. We've got humble underlined. We've got prayer underlined. And then it says, seek my face. And so you're probably thinking, where in the world did you come up with communion and fellowship? Well, when we seek God's face, to seek His face, we're living in His presence. Therefore, we are communion and fellowshipping with Him. You see, prayer is the doorway through which we enter into that communion with God. He says to seek my face. So in Scripture here, it instructs us to seek God and to do so continually. We can read that in several different passages of Scriptures. But he tells us here to commune and fellowship with God is to live one's life every second as if we are serving before God's throne in heaven. It is to be in a constant, I guess, dialogue with God. It's to be intimate with Him. Talking to Him face to face, right? Just like how we do when we're married, right? We talk and we communicate with our spouse face to face. We have that intimate communion when we can talk. Now, we can text, and probably a lot of us text, uh, some of us call, but it's different when we are face to face. And so when we enter that prayer closet and we come before our knees humbly before the Lord and we seek His face, we're seeking that communion that fellowship with Him. And that's what He's asking us to do. We pray. We say, God, give us our daily bread. You see, the Lord spoke face to face with Moses. We can read in the Scripture in the book of Exodus. Uh, to seek God's face is to walk with God as Enoch did in the Scriptures. Uh, it's such a close fellowship that the line between earth and heaven became blurred, so to speak. 
that closeness, that restoration. You see, when you're, when you're trying to restore something, say an automobile, I mean, you've got you've to be face to face with that thing and you've got to work out those blemishes and it's almost like you're there. You're, you're present with whatever needs to be restored. Maybe it's a piece or a part. You, you have that, and I know it's a weird analogy, but you have that communion with whatever you're working on. You're, you're, you're very tedious with it. That's what God's saying. This is... He says, this is what I need from my people. He says, I need you all to humble yourselves. I need you to pray. And I need you to seek my face. I need you to come before me. Paul commanded or communed with God. And the Bible says that he was caught up, the Bible says, in heaven. God wants to lead us to humility and to prayer and then from prayer into communion. That's the third step to the process. And then the last one here is what we read in verse 14. It says, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I wonder what we would call that. I would call it repentance. That's the last and fourth step to the process is repentance. Spiritual restoration can only take place when we realize that we've got wrong in our life and we try to correct it. You see, repentance is the offspring, I guess you can look at it, as communion. And so this is not the same repentance as the repentance that we're praying for salvation. This is the type of repentance when we are addressing the Lord. We know that we've got wrong in our lives or we are caught up into something that has kind of pulled our fellowship away from the Lord. And God reminds us of that. And He says, you guys need to repent. He says, you need to repent. And that's what He's telling us believers here, is that we need to repent. And you see, He tells us there in the book of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I'm not going to quote all of those, but He talks about a transformation that takes place by the renewing of our mind. Got to change the way we think. He says that the restoration process can take place by renewing our minds. He says not to be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. You, you know where I'm going with this scripture. You, you all probably have read it many times. So God intends to bring us from humility into prayer, from prayer into communion with God, and finally communion gives birth to Repentance, a mental renewance is what he's trying to tell us. A change of mindset allows us to turn from our wicked ways. You know, I, I've always heard it said before that the difference between heaven and hell is only like 16 inches. It's between our head and our heart. When you're talking to someone who need salvation. But I think even in our own lives, we can relate this message to so many different things, but our mindset plays a big role in the restoration process spiritually. I think sometimes we probably suffer in our own marriages. Our marriages need a restoration. Well, maybe if we just humble ourselves, Maybe we can get our relationship better where it needs to be when you talk about spouses. Maybe there needs to be a restoration process in some friendships or some family situations where we've got to humble ourselves. And you probably think, well, I know, but that other person's not going to humble themselves. You know what? We can't control those other people. The only thing we can do is what God would ask us to do. And sometimes we've got to come down off that high horse and realize, you know what? God, we're nothing without you. And God, I don't know what you're going to be doing in this situation or in this problem or in this home or within this family. But God, I've got to humble myself and I've got to realize, God, you are the only way that I can get through this situation. So God, I, my mindset has to change. I have to humble myself. God, I've got to pray. I need to seek your face. And God, if there's some wrong in my own life, maybe I need to quit pointing Fingers and look at the fingers that's pointing back at me. 
if I want true restoration to take place in relationships. Now, it's not really where our lesson was going today, but you can almost draw some parallels to that. God help me. God wants to do a great work in our lives, church. He wants to do a great work in your home, in your marriage, in the workplace. He wants to do a lot of great things. And this process here could be taken in so many different avenues. These four steps here of spiritual restoration are not independent of each other. I want us to understand that. So the believer here humbles himself before God. Then he goes before the Almighty God in prayer. And because he recognizes that he must submit to the will of the Lord of hosts, the believer then discerns the will of God through prayer, seeks God's face, and because he's wanting to walk in the will of God, he realizes that he's got some, some hiccups in his life, some sin in his life, and he realizes that his closeness with the Lord is not where it used to be, and he sees some of those uh, roadblocks, some of those blocks, stumbling blocks that's in the way, and because God reveals that because He has sought God's face, all of a sudden now it's almost like you have a wake-up call. And it's almost like, God, I, I see what I said. I see what I've done. I see what I'm not doing. And because what I'm not doing, God, my communion with You is off. And I need a restoration process in my life. And all of a sudden when you humble and pray, and seek God's face, and you have that communion with Him, God helps you see your needs, and you can repent of those things. What God's trying to tell us today. He was trying to speak this with the Israelite people here. We've got a genuine repent. And it doesn't just say repent, but it says to turn from. We can repent of the sin and God will, for, God will forgive us. But there needs to be a time where we draw the line and we turn from what God has sent us from. Does that make sense? We can't just keep repeating because we know that God is a merciful God and God will keep forgiving us. We have the different mindset change. Well, you know, if I do this, all I got to do is ask God to forgive me and, and it's just fine and 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 then you just keep doing it, and, you're, and it's, it's a habitual thing that you just make it a habit. That's not what God wants to do. God wants to do a restoration process, and a restoration is where He takes something that needs some work, and He makes it anew, right? Um, there isn't any one of us in here that would like to take a home, and we put all this sweat equity in, and all these finances in, and fix them up, and then all of a sudden we forgot that maybe the electrical needed updated and we get this whole thing done and all of a sudden we've got to break into the walls because the electrical is not where it needs to be. It's not up to par. It's, it's not up to the spec. And all this work that you've done is because you forgot this one little thing. What God wants to do is He's wanting to take all of us the inside out and He wants to restore it. I remember in my own life, uh, the Lord did a great work in me. I wasn't a, a real bad kid. That's what my mom said. <laughs> she said, I raised some good boys. Well, yes, you did, Mom, but your good boys had some sin in their lives. I remember those times when I was wild and crazy and doing things that I probably shouldn't have done. And I remember some individuals that spoke life unto me and I realized I had sin in my life. And I got before the uh, uh, sharing of God's Word and I began to read God's Word and it's almost like, God, I, I feel you in my heart and I feel like there's some things there that need fixed, but I don't know how to fix them. And I talked with friends uh, that I was hanging around with at that time and they were a great influence to me. And they said, Brian, you're just going to have to seek the Lord and pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins. And man, I fought this for a long time. It was almost like three weeks. I knew that I needed Christ in my life, but I just didn't quite understand. And, but as that friendship began to blossom, they began to share with me the processes of repenting. And we did that, and 
and the, the Lord did a great work in my life and there were a lot of things that I was doing that after I got saved and I asked Christ in my heart, I, I no longer had a desire to do anymore. That's what the Lord does with her life. That's what that restoration process was. <laughs> the way I used to talk, I no longer want to talk the same. Some of those folks that I hung out with, I no longer hung out with because it seemed like every time I would hang out with them, I got myself into trouble. But my mom thought I was a good boy. Isn't that something how we can deceive our parents? I raised some good boy. Well, your good boys got themselves into trouble at times, mom, that did some things that you probably are not aware of. But God is always aware of our situation, right? He's aware of your heart. He is aware of maybe you've got some things swept under the rug, right? How many of you like cleaning house? All right, I'm not going to raise, ask anybody to raise their hands because I probably pretty much know. Have you ever been guilty of sweeping things under the rug? Ben, I know you have. So um, you got cats saying, hey, hon, can you sweep the living room? Can you do this or that? And boy, you're working and you're sweating. And, and it's almost like, you know, and she goes into the other room and it's like, I see this here. I've already made one trip to the trash can or whatever. Or I've already dumped the vacuum sweeper once. So, and it's like, man, you know, I, I did it. But you have this guilty conscience in your mind that you knew that you tricked your spouse into sweeping something under the rug. And we have that same mentality sometimes with God. God asks us to clean some things up, and we do. We'll, we'll go to church maybe once a month, twice a month. We'll, we'll try to make some time to be in the Word. And we, we, we go because we think that's what we're supposed to, and we are supposed to do that. I mean, God wants us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together because He knows the benefits of communion together what it brings in the Christian life and in the family. But there are some things we feel like we can sweep under the rug. And you might be able to get by with it for a while. But sooner or later, it will get caught up with you. And, and sooner or later, God will say, hey, you know, I, I've been watching you do this for a long, long time. And I'm not pleased with it. I would rather you repent and so I can restore that area in your life. But you've got to humble yourself and you've got to seek my face and realize what you're doing is not pleasing to me. You see, that's how that restoration process starts, realizing some of our, I guess, are not so strong. So I want to encourage you today as we begin to kind of finish up, is where are you at in this process of restoration, spiritually speaking? You're here today and we appreciate the opportunity to speak life into you all today and to share with you God's Word out of the book of Second Chronicles. But there's a, there's a four-step process to this restoration. I don't know where you're at today, and I would certainly encourage you to ask your own selves, where are you at in this process? Are you humble? And it's basically stopped there. Have you been praying and you've stopped there? Maybe you've not really communed with the Lord and sought His face and have that closeness with Him. Or, or maybe you've not even made it that far and therefore you can't see your sin or you don't realize that there are some areas in your life that needs taken care of. So as Brother Ben comes forward with a song of invitation today, I, I want to extend this invitation to you all here today. Where are you? in the process. Maybe today could be the awesome opportunity to go to base one. To go to step one and realize, man, I'm not being humble. I've been prideful and full, full of pride and therefore because I'm full of pride, I can't be humble. But God is speaking to your heart this morning through His Spirit and He's speaking to you and He's saying, hey, maybe you need to come and pray. You've humbled yourself. Would you take that extra step and say, I need to pray. I need to seek your face. Maybe you need to repent of some things. I would encourage you, if you would, stand with me at this time. I want to go to the Lord in prayer just real quick and ask God's blessing 
upon this invitational time. And our brother's going to sing before us. So let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, today. God, we love Your grace and we love Your mercy. God, we're so thankful, God, that You are still in the restoration business. You're still taking lives, Lord, and converting them. You're still, Father, helping people realize some of their struggles in life. Maybe, Lord, there might be someone in our presence here today that is being humbled underneath this message, Lord, because they realize they've had it all wrong. Lord Jesus, I pray that You would speak to their heart. And Lord, if they need to pray, whether it be at their seats or whether they would like to come forward, may they commune with You and seek Your face and repent of maybe some of their issues or some of their struggles or some of their sin. And God, would You help them to repent and turn from it? And God, if they do that, they would take care of that four-step process to spiritual restoration today. Lord, what a great day that would be to start off this day with being restored. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone, even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.